tonight that will go over the main areas of interest to the district. Uh, lots are repeat from last year uh, when you had a presentation from her. And she has been with us working on our behalf since January of 2019. She started just before the long session last year and um, has continued her work this year, which has been wonderful. And she's also been working with Janine on some um, more recent topics that you might find interesting. So I'd like to introduce Kylie. Um, we're thrilled to have her. She has 50, over 15 years of experience, both in the public policy realm and within governmental relations. So she's been um, a joy to work with. And um, though she mainly was contacting Keith Hobson um, prior to his departure from the district, I now get the pleasure of working with her and um, I really do enjoy it and think that she uh, is an excellent advocate for us. And so I'm pleased to turn this over to her so she can share with you her presentation. So go for it, Kylie. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation and it has been a joy and a pleasure to work with you as well um, uh, over these last few months. So um, Jessica, am I telling you when to share slides or was I going to share the PowerPoint on my end? And it's Great, okay. No, it's okay. Do you just want me to tell that we can start right there? Oops. Sorry. Having issues. Okay. There you go. Um, so I am going to start walking through these slides and please, um, I, however works best for you, if you want to interrupt me as I go or save your questions, I, I will do whatever makes sense. Um, I thought I'd start off with a little bit of a review of kind of the key legislative dates over the next few weeks. So on the 7th, any bill drafts that folks were working on um, were due back to Legislative Council. And then starting on this past Monday, they did interim legislative days. In the past, those days have been um, limited to about three legislative days and they just jam pack a whole bunch of committee hearings into one and that's where you get like your um, different reports and updates on bills and whatnot. Um, and also, I just jumped right in. If you want to slow down or do anything, let me know. But I'm just going to jump in and we'll we'll go through this thing um, and you can ask me any questions along the way. Um, but anyway, so I spread them out because there's been concerns in this virtual world about how much um, ability on virtually to be able to attend and listen and participate when things were happening at the same time uh, in a different way than if you were in the building, you could kind of go from hearing to hearing. So they've spread them out over these two weeks. And it's during these two weeks that we may um, have a special session. And as of today, the last I heard was that there could be one on the 14th because they hadn't scheduled any other uh, committee hearings that day. So that's kind of the day we're honing in on that may be um, that special session. And I'll come back to that in just a minute. So then anybody who's working on a bill has to give that back to the Legislative Council by the 21st. And then we'll kind of have a break over the holidays um, as far as dates and deadlines go. And then that week of January 11th to 15th is kind of when things really start going legislatively. Those are organizational days, which are sort of new. Um, and they're, they're like those interim days, but they are when um, the committees get announced. They are when all the bills are published. They're kind of getting everything ready so that on that first day of legis the legislature, things can actually be heard and committees can meet and whatnot. Um, there's a couple things happening around that start date of January 19th uh, because that is the statutorily decided day for the session. Now this is all very interesting on this year because one, um, the start of the legislature is really the only thing that's in, that's in statute because the length of our sessions and the um, extension of our sessions are in our constitution. So you can't change them through legislative action. The start date you can and that's important this year because with COVID and the pandemic um, and trying to figure out how we're going to be virtually, that is one thing that they could impact. The legislature could look at a different or a later start date, and that could be done in a special session. Um, and so that's why that's important. The other key thing that's happening here is um, I put in there that the speaker will be elected. Generally, the last couple sessions, that's been a given. Um, uh, speaker Tina Kotek has been kind of the, the leader and the known leader the last couple of years. This year there is a challenge challenger for that seat. Um, Janelle, Representative Janelle Bynum out of the Clackamas area is making a run for it. And the reason that's important is because they will announce the committees, the, the general structure of them in the next couple of days. 
Um, and generally we would know that that's going to be who the committees are and we can make our outreach and start to have meetings and whatnot because we kind of know who is going to be in what spot. If a speaker changes and it will change right at that beginning of the session, that changes kind of a lot of the playing field that would change committee makeups, committee chairs, it, could, it will change priorities, some of which you're going to hear about in, on these next couple slides. So those are some key dates that are going to be um, and, and actions that could really impact how this all works in what's already a really unusual year. So then if we did start on January 19th, um, the constitutional signing die, the day we'd have to be done because we can only go 160 days is June 28th. So that's kind of the what's happening over the next couple of weeks legislatively. Um, and if there is a special session, um, it would likely be a catastrophic one. You can only call those once per catastrophe. It keeps the, lim the items that you're looking at limited. Um, and, uh, the reason and the driver for that is really still about COVID response that has to do with extending the eviction moratorium and also some additional support for small businesses because that eviction moratorium ends at the end of this year. Um, if we don't have a special session, the, uh, the governor could extend it through executive order, but they're trying to, and the speaker would really like to have a special session to look at that and a couple other um, COVID related issues. Uh, President of the Senate, Peter Courtney, has not yet signed off on that. That's why we haven't yet heard an announcement. So we're kind of waiting to see whether or not that gets called for Monday the 14th. So next slide. So uh, there's very few knowns other than that, what's in the Constitution, that there will be a session and it will be 160 days long, or will not go longer than 160 days. But other than that, as I laid out for you, um, there's a lot of unknowns. The starting date we think is that January 2019th, that could be changed. Um, how we operate, how we're going to actually meet is really up in the air. The legislature's had a committee looking at kind of planning for operations and coming up with some different scenarios since September, uh, but everything continues to change and evolve as it will in these kinds of situations. They had in September kind of been looking at the different phases and if Salem went to phase two, what would that mean for people to be able to go into the, into the building? Now we've got these risk categories and Marion County isn't looking great in there. And there are a lot of legislators who are rightly concerned that going into Salem and being in a building in any con context for the next couple of months doesn't make any sense. So as of right now, we're hearing that it's likely going to be meeting virtually through the through April. Um, but you may have also heard that there's been challenges with how like these special sessions have gone and the ability to interact with legislation and how that all would work because it is very limited even with all of our virtual platforms. Um, I was talking to one senator and she was saying that there was one of her priorities that she'd been working on and she read about something that happened with that priority in the Oregonian before she knew about it, um, which was very disconcerting for her. And it's just kind of indicative of it, it's challenging to do this work in, in very remotely the way it is. I mean, we do it and we're making it work, but it is challenging. Um, and so also that speaker election at the beginning of session, um, that it is at this point, it sounds unlikely that Representative Biden will be successful, but if it is successful, it would be a shakeup on the House side and, and kind of, um, we'd have to come back to you probably on some of these things to reprioritize, um, what we know is coming. Kylie, I'm sorry to interrupt. I have a question. This is Wendy. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and that it has to do with the House leadership and the challenge for it. I was just wondering, and you were alluding to it, do we have any idea um, what Ms. Bynum's um, priorities are, or has she expressed any concerns that are different than the ones we would ordinarily think that we would be dealing with? Well, I don't they, I mean, she would, it's, they'd be similar, but some of the ones that are unique to Speaker Kotek, um, you'll hear, we'll talk a little bit about system development charges. Um, and some issues around a, a court case called Boise v. Martin, which has to do with right to rest. Um, it's not that they wouldn't be priorities of kind of the, the Democratic caucus, but they may not be as as on her top list the way they are on Speaker Kotex. And um, Representative Bynum is also leading some of the racial justice and the police accountability work. And not that Speaker Kotek isn't very supportive of those, but we just may see a shuffling of what is the, um, you know, kind of the first things that need to get done. Speaker Kotek has had a long uh, history of supporting the housing realm. And it's just, it'd be more 
about what gets done first and where some of the, the emphasis is put as we go through session. It would also impact the fact that if Representative Bynum were to be elected, she probably would have to make some agreements with some of, of folks across the aisle, some Republicans. And so we'd probably see Republicans either switching um, committees that they would like to switch on, or maybe even some leadership positions within committees. So that's some of the shakeup that could happen as well, which would then lead to other priorities that we don't get, see right now, but coming through these the committee shakeup. Thank you. Um, I think we are on next slide. So these I pulled from some of your materials. Um, this is the mission, the vision, and the diversity inclusion statements. Um, so I'm looking at these because we're going to go through these policy statements to get your feedback. But in addition to those policy statements, we really look to these to also be kind of our guideposts as we look at legislation and kind of figure out where we want to be on any position or bill or any of that stuff. So just wanted you to know that we use these kind of as our big umbrella guiding principles as we move forward. Next slide. Okay, so the next couple of slides are going to be position statements. As you read them, and I'll try to tell you where some of them are newer or are similar to ones you've heard before, um, because on the, the, the very first one we're going to talk about, I'd love to get feedback because it is a new position for um, the board to consider. So do these position statements accurately reflect the board's positions? Um, are some of them too broad, not broad enough? What's missing? Um, any kind of feedback like that? Because this is what I'll look to first as far as kind of guiding me in, in my conversations and in how we operate I would say in the building, but I guess virtually in the building, it'll really be those kind of guideposts for me. So next slide. Okay, so I'm starting with this one. Um, actually, I do want to say one more thing, but we don't need to go back uh, to the previous slide. I would also say that these five position statements that you're going to see, they're not everything that's important to the board because there's lots of different issues and things that we may care about or things we may need to take a position on. But these are ones that we know are likely to be addressed in the session and that would have an impact on THPRD and or things that represent a position unique to THPRD, somewhere where we just need to make sure we kind of have an understanding because it would impact us um, in a way that not necessarily other jurisdictions or other organizations. And then we also work in really close collaboration with ORPA, Oregon Rex and Park Association, and then um, the Special Districts Association of Oregon. And we work strategically together a lot on several of these issues too to be, is it coalition? Is it just one of us have the kind of best leg to stand on? Is it when uh, maybe TH Birdie isn't the right lead organization for something? So um, just because it's something isn't represented in these position statements doesn't mean one, we won't end up taking a position on it or two, that it's not important. We're just trying to elevate um, and be kind of strategic in, in this first look at what we think is coming. Um, so this one is the is new, uh, Martin V. Boise and Right Trust, and I'm not an attorney, um, so I have layperson language, and please, for those of you that are attorneys, feel free to correct me or um, know that I'm coming at it in, in more of the public policy way. So this is about um, Right to Rest. There was a court decision, um, there was a, a court case in Boise, Idaho, where several people sued the city over some of their ordinances that banned camping um, and uh, sleeping and said that they uh, violated the Eighth Amendment about cruel and unusual punishment. Um, I don't want to go too deep into the court case, though I can. I've got a little bit more information and other cases that have come along. Um, but basically, through the different judicial decisions, it's it went up to, an, an, um, to the Supreme Court that they decided not to hear it. And so basically, what that means is that they've affirmed that the Eighth Amendment precludes as it says in this orange box, the enforcement of a statute prohibiting sleeping outside against homeless individuals with no access to alternative shelter. Um, so this is looking at Boise and how to not necessarily incorporate into our statutes, but adjust or revise our state statute to align with the decision um, is something that's been of interest to Speaker Kotek, to the um, Oregon Trial Lawyers Association and the Oregon Law Center. Um, she's tried it a few times in the past, but this time she went to the Oregon Law Center and to the League of Oregon Cities and asked them to sit down and come up with some consensus language um, that would both recognize that cities can, should not be able to ban camping, but also 
that there is this allowance for reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions. And so there, there's been a few meetings with different city attorneys and, and the law center to try to come up with some um, language and really focus on those reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions. So this policy statement um, is one that is new and you haven't seen it before, um, so really open to feedback. But the idea to guide me would be a balancing of THPRD's population experiencing homelessness with the need um, to have THPRD's facilities and amenities remain safe and accessible to all THPRD residents. And there's a question. Felicia? Hi, Hi Kylie. <laughs> Thanks, Dia. <Hello>. <laughs> um, so I am really struck by the word safe in this um, value statement. Um, I want us to be super, super mindful um, that for the most part, individuals experiencing homelessness are not a risk to our own safety. Um, their safety is at risk. Um, you know, a mom uh, leaving a, a domestic violence situation, sleeping with her two kids in the car, like that doesn't make me less safe. That makes our community less safe um, and that individual and family less safe. So I I really am not a fan of that word. Um, I And I also, I would want it to include something about our commitment to natural resources because I think about how, like, as an example, during, like, in the spring when all the uh, um, seniors in high school are getting their photos taken and they all go off the off the paths and we put up signs begging them not to, like, we as an organization have a commitment to maintaining those natural resources, so we can't have anyone on those resources because it's about protecting animals um, and uh, trees. So I when I think about this issue, I, I think about it, one, in terms of our, our commitment to our individuals facing homelessness and the they don't have a lot of options. So that's why I'm so proud of the affordable housing work that we do and all the other, you know, we're going to be a warming shelter. And I think about the commitment that we've made to the community about maintaining these natural resources. Um, so I would just like to see those um, things included here. Uh, that makes a ton of sense. And I will say that when that we pulled the information that the, the TH that statement, the second half, from um, some of the, I think it's either in the mission revision or one of those statements. And so it's a little bit of a different context. You're one hundred percent right. So we should adjust that about just keeping the amenities accessible or or we'll we'll finesse that a little bit to address exactly what you're saying because it's it's and maintaining the natural resources, yeah, and add, yeah. And then adding, I think, maybe even a second bullet point about however, whatever this looks like, um, we need to maintain our commitment to the natural resources we provide to the community. Thanks, Kylie. You're welcome. Anything, anybody else? And I really appreciate this because the more uh, feedback we get now and kind of clarity on these statements, the easier it is for me to um, wade into conversations. So I'm open to anything. Kylie, this is Wendy, and if it, if numbers count, I totally agree with Felicita. So, great. If okay. It helps. I also agree. Um, this is Tia, and then um, I I'm not sure how far or if people are talking about um, as far as homelessness and like parking and being able to park. Um, I think people who are living in cars or whatnot. At, the reasonable time and place, and at night, I don't pose them as a danger for sleeping in the cars, like on public property or parking lots and stuff. So um, I don't know if that's helpful information for you, Kylie, but I know we started our pilot program um, for that and that was done or, and is going well, I um, have heard. So um, that's just something just extra, an extra tidbit. That is helpful. And I think right now the focus of this is really looking at these outdoor public spaces and not so much like parking facilities or buildings or any other types of public property and really folks who are outdoors and how to what extent they can kind of take care of themselves um, and like with what what constitutes bedding materials and those kinds of things. But um, if there is anything around parking, uh, whether it's in this or something else, I'll make sure to bring it back to the board to be able to see what that looks like. Thank you. You're welcome. So I think we can go to the next slide unless there's um, more to discuss here. Okay, so this is another big area of work. So the, the Martin uh, or the Boise v. Martin has had you know several meetings happening. Um, what's had even more meetings happening over the last several months has been um, a work group on system development charges. There had this, and this is another thing that is one of the speaker's priorities. She has 
tried to have it addressed the last couple of sessions, but it, it's it's hard and it hasn't happened yet. And she had wanted to have a work group after the last long session. Um, things kind of delayed it from happening right away. And then the um, short session in the way it kind of concluded with the walkout and then COVID has really kept it from um, coming together the way she'd hoped. Uh, Representative John Lively, who's the chair of the House Economic Development Committee, offered to pick this back up for her um, this a few months ago, starting in the fall, to have a discussion about system development charges. Um, we are really lucky because the um, Special Districts Association of Oregon was allowed to pick two of the folks on the work group, and one of them is our own Janine Rustad to represent parks. Uh, Parks and Recreation Districts, which has been really wonderful. She has been um, doing stellar work, and I've gotten a couple reach outs from other either members or stakeholders talking about kind of how helpful she's been in expressing um, sort of clear and concise information on that work group. So um, I'm going to have her kind of give a, an overview of the work that she's done, but I will say um, that there's about five, I think five legislative members on there um, from all over the state. Representative Janine Solman out of Hillsborough, who has a little portion of the TH Parity District is also um, on there. We've reached out to her a couple of times and we actually just provided her with, she'd requested some information about our recent SDC methodology update and we provided that to her. And I think we're gonna try to meet with her in the next couple of days. Um, but I would say, I spoke with Representative Lively this morning, and there's been some real concerns when we went into this about what they were really trying to do with this and what kind of what was the expected outcome, what kind of bills did we expect to see. And I chatted with him, and he is not too committed to having any sort of bills come out of this work group necessarily. Um, he, he was talking more how we could see a study, kind of a comprehensive study about why we have SDCs, what they do, and what happens if we, if we've maxed out SDCs or if we pull them back, how do cities, local jurisdictions, parks, raise those revenues that they need for uh, infrastructure? Um, so that's kind of good news that some of the things that were on the table may not be on the table right now. So we're continuing to monitor that. Uh, Felicia, I see you have your, I love this little hand up thing. It's great. <laughs> I know, I feel so bad for you, Kylie, that you can't see us nodding. Like, oh, I, that was I'm, right. like, I'm just gonna keep talking to like <laughs> hand or here and excuse me. Um, well, I'm I'm sure Doug told us earlier that Janine was on that work group, so I apologize for not remembering, but that's fantastic. That's the mm -hmm. perfect person to be on that work group. Um, and uh, I get so one I was going to say Janine Solman is my state rep. Um, so if I can be helpful, please let me know. We have a good relationship. Um, and um, oh, there was something else I was going to say. Maybe it was just props to Janine. Okay, I think I said. <laughs> well, if you think of it, let me know. Um, so we haven't done a lot of direct outreach to the legislators yet, other than some of us lobbyist types, only because it hasn't been clear yet where they were headed. And we didn't want to kind of use up some of that outreach until we had a better sense of what we wanted to try to support or what we were to share our concerns. So as we get further along and we see what's actually gonna come out of this group, um, there is a very good chance we'll come back to you and ask to be helpful in some of that outreach um, in one way or another. So it was more of a, as I like to save I use myself for the kind of the in the weeds conversations and trying to get information and save board members and your outreach for kind of the big guns when it really matters. Um, so as we know more and, and when we can have the idea of when we need to have those conversations, so you'll definitely hear from me. So I think I'll turn it over to Jean now to kind of talk about her participation in the work group and, and give kind of a, a recap of their work. And then we can walk through these policy statements um, to go through kind of if there's changes or feedback there. So I'll, I would hand it over to you, Janine. Did I catch you off guard? Are you there? You may be on mute, Janine. Thank you. I had <laughs> internet problems and I think I'm still frazzled from that. Um, so as Kylie mentioned, there is a, a mix of representatives from throughout the state on this committee, as well as special districts, cities, counties, home builders, and one affordable housing rep who, she was at the first meeting, but I don't know that she's been at many more. And it, the, the first meeting was FCS, who is a consultant that uh, deals, I think, very largely in, in SDCs. We've used them in the past. 
us. They gave an overview. Um, the next meeting, we had an opportunity, we being several jurisdictions and including myself, to give an overview of how we use THP, or excuse me, SDCs, how we come up with them, uh, some of the issues, and it, it came out of uh, a paper, one pager from uh, Organs for Smart Growth, but some of the concerns that we've heard are, um, starting with the non-personal one, is the timing of SDCs. And that's something that's getting a lot of airplay. Uh, they're charged at the point of building permit. The builders have said, well, that's a huge burden for us to carry this cost. Um, one of our friends at Beaverton did a little spreadsheet and it, on average, it's probably 400, 500. It can be depending on the size of the, or the, the, the jurisdiction, a thousand per house uh, in interest cost. But we're also trying to dispel that timing it's, it's one thing to defer the timing. We've done it for affordable housing development if it's multifamily. Single family, that gets very hard and there's a lot of additional cost. And you're going to be hearing in the regular board meeting, our IGA, where the cost of collecting those fees for the city and the county on our behalf has gone up. So it's, it's not automatic. How do you record a first lien? Make sure you get that first lien. But it's, I, I think the conversation, there's more interest in, in the, the timing as it impacts the smaller builders. Um, another issue has been the transparency. And my question to the committee was, we are required to report annually on what we've collected and how we've spent SDCs. I don't think it's a transparency issue because at least with us and everyone else I talk to in local government, if you call us, we will talk to you about it. It's a complex issue. Um, government financing is complex enough. You get into SDCs. You all have done an amazing job getting up to speed. But uh, so I'm not sure how you, you get around the fact that it is complex. Uh, I was very relieved to see the summary today of Kylie's uh, conversation with Representative Lively that uh, hopefully there isn't anything big. And really, um, to, to end this here, is the two messages I've been trying to carry is one, let's keep local autonomy. Uh, you can't make a one size fits all SDCs. And one of the questions was the varying levels and really driving home the, the message that our level of service is driven through our visioning process, through all these engagement processes that we do. And that's what goes into part of the equation for SDCs. The second with timing is if you want to mandate deferring, then let the state set up an account where the developers would borrow to pay the local government and then the state can track and be responsible for making sure it gets collected. Because the last thing we want, especially with single family housing, is to be left in a position where they don't get paid, the developer says, oops, too bad, and now we have to go over, go after that individual property owner. And I should say lastly, um, another thing that I've been saying is there's conversations about um, SDCs, affordable housing, missing middle housing, all happening in silos. They're all interrelated and we need to be talking about infrastructure our state does not make a big investment in infrastructure, whether it's parks, pipes, pavement, that, and, and we need to think of affordable housing as infrastructure. Uh, few head nods during the, the meeting on that. Um, so there's big issues. Hopefully it will be a longer conversation. So Kylie, did I cover that good enough? You did great. Thank you so much. Um, and I think it's a part of the reason why Representative Lively was saying that up, if it were up to him, he's not sure there'd be need be, to be any legislation other than more study because when you were presenting Janine and some of the other local jurisdictions, you did a really great job of sharing with him 
exactly we're talking about that local autonomy and the fact that we're talking about local needs and infrastructure. And if you're going to do something with SDCs, that infrastructure and those needs don't go away. So how are we going to do this? And he's heard that loud and clear. So I think that's really great. So there's another hand up. Oh, Kylie, this is Tia. I just wanted to give ourselves a 15 minute reminder um, that we have 15 more minutes just before we need to close up and move on to the next session. Thank you for that. I can talk too long, so yeah. I appreciate no it very much. <laughs> um, so we can wrap this up. The, the first three statements there um, are kind of the policy statements we've used in the past to um, guide us. We add the last one to support any efforts to secure additional state funding of infrastructure based on sort of how these conversations are going and um, what would really make a difference in how um, and, and what are needed via SDCs or some of the other revenue sources. Um, and to focus on the fact that we're in this place because of some of the restrictions that have been placed on other revenue sources and the fact that the state isn't in investing in these things. So that's one of the, uh, we added that additional statement. So are there any questions or concerns with any of those? Yes. Yeah, thanks for this. And um, I, I, you know, I'm glad we're being proactive. And um, uh, to me, this is just an example of like we've done all this work and like we're one piece of the pie. Um, and so we're an easy piece to target. Um, but I, I think it, I wish they, I wish this was a bigger conversation around like who are the, who are your leaders at special districts, right? I mean, I could get really nerdy on this, but um, I'm glad we're being proactive about this. I agree with all of this. And I, I think it, like we as a leadership board decided this was important to us um, and showed, made our decision-making based on our commitment to our community and our values and other organizations should get to do that as well. And they should be held accountable by their constituents, just like we are. So <laughs> Exactly. And that's some of our messaging too. It's um, that we need to be able to meet the needs and the priorities of our local communities and our various governing boards, um, which is when you let us do that, we do great things like what THPRD is doing. And that's what I shared with Representative Lively this morning. Um, yeah. So I think we can go to the next slide. Okay, so this one's only slightly different um, than previous, but fairly similar. So it's all about preserving and enhancing to the extent that we can um, uh, the funding levels for the local government grant program, Oregon Community Pass program, the um, State Department and, and other programs where we can get funding for uh, parks and rec and trails. The second piece I called out because this is based on the good work that happened um, in the last session that helped with Connect Oregon, which actually the piece that is the program through Connect Oregon is now that Oregon Community Pathways, but it was to make sure that some of those, that, that the funding decisions through Connect Oregon for trails was not made necessarily by ODOT, but actually by Parks and Trails folks and to make sure we keep it that way. Um, so that's why I slightly changed those policy statements to recognize we want that maintaining of ownership of decision-making for these funding allocations is by um, more of the Parks and Trails side of things than it would be through ODOT. Um, so there's a slight nuance there, but essentially the same thing. Um, we, the budget, well, I'm sure you've all heard and I've, I've sent updates that it's slightly better than it was. Um, it's still, it can be referred to as a cuts budget. So um, we're working in, see your hand up. I do love that little hand thing. Hi, Kylie. Um, I Hi. want to thank you for putting in that prioritized parks and recreation as opposed to uh, ODOT. Um, because the focus is so totally different. And we've had to have ODOT standards and rules that don't necessarily fit parks and trails and recreation. So I thank you very, very much for putting that in. Yeah, of course. And then this is one thing where we also work really closely with ORPA on this piece. All right, so I think we can go to the next slide. Um, and so this is one where we don't necessarily know of anything um, coming down the road on any of these um, yet because we haven't seen all the bills but this is kind of one of those where we have a unique perspective about um, our local agency control and authority so obviously if we see anything that starts to look at weakening how um, 
our local agency control or any unfunded mandates, which there always seems to be something that goes down this road, these kind of guide me how to respond to those. So please let me know if you have any questions or concerns on this one, but this is the same as, as previous years. This is perfect. Thank you, Kylie. Great. Okay. So we can go to the next slide. So I just want to touch base on this because, you know, it's, it's, it's top of mind these days is the um, COVID-19 relief and what's happening. Um, so I just put in there that on November 23rd, uh, Governor Brown sent in letters with Wyden and Merkley about needing um, additional congressional relief. I'm sure that all of you know that I think Tuesday is when we um, that the that and more information about that bipartisan, bipartisan Senate bill. It's um, is it 908 billion dollars um, in support, and a key part of that is I think there's about 160 billion. I put my number away now, but I believe that's what's in my head. That would go to local governments. Um, and, and so we've been advocating um, uh, through your federal lobbyists to um, make sure that special districts like THPRD are considered as part of anything that goes to local government. So I know there's been a lot of connection and outreach with the federal delegation. On the state side, we've been sending out updates over the um, last couple months that have updated our, especially our THPRD delegation um, about the status of our facilities and then the impact of COVID on both our facilities and the district and what it's done um, kind of to our finances and to the staffing and whatnot um, along the way. And so we're now also making sure to include that message that if and when we see any congressional uh, additional dollars and it does have those funds for local governments, that if they have any opportunity to support special districts being part of anything received by local government, um, that they do so. So that's also some of what we're working on. And I, I think, the last thing, I think, well, it varies on who I talk to. Some folks kind of see this package that's being debated right now as as an expectation um, because it's, it's it gives Republicans it's a little less than what the Democrats have proposed on the House side. The Democrats know with an incoming administration, it'll be easier to get something that is more closely aligned with what they'd like. And so this seems like something that can actually pass. So um, if it is going to pass, it would be in the next couple of days. And we'll make sure, I'm sure you'll hear from your federal lobbyists. You'll also hear from me about what that looks like. And then we'll spend some time trying to figure out what that actually means as far as funding available for um, special districts. So I think unless there's questions, we can go to the next slide. Okay, so uh, I'm going to need you. <laughs> so, and I really appreciate um, any, the support that I, I will ask for. And I think I mentioned it earlier that I do try to save um, kind of your direct outreach and when we're working on a bill kind of when we really need it. But when I do, when you do make that outreach, it has been and made all the difference in several different instances. So one of the first areas um, where there will be a need for your time would be uh, to review, review the bills. So in that uh, timeline I shared at the very beginning of this presentation, there's that organizational days period when um, bills will start to be published. And I have um, a bill reporting service where I can go through all of the bills and kind of pull out the ones that I think will have an impact and some that I'm not sure of. And I'll kind of put those in a package and I deliver those to Aisha and to Doug. And um, as we, and there will be a tight turnaround because then session will start and we won't know which bills may be heard right away. So getting your review, your feedback, or if there is something I'm missing that you've heard of to make sure that I do track, um, that's one way that your feedback and your review is super helpful. Um, and then I'll work with Aisha to con on what works best for the board, but to give you a, a bill report update as we move through session about those bills that we've identified as either supporting, opposing, or something we need to watch um, uh, to give you reports on on those as we move through the session. Um, and, and back to that legislative outreach on priority bills and issues. So as we watch some of those things that we just discussed on the policy statements, making sure I keep you updated on anything that fits or touches upon those. Um, and when they rise to a level where we think either we need your help or to help them move or we need your help to make things not move um i will reach out and and your participation there is is very helpful and i can arrange that and work with aisha whatever works best for you about dropping talking points or letters or emails or however whatever level of support in that outreach um is is based on what's best for the board and for each of you so we can work through that as well 
Um, in the past, we've done like a little mini lobby day where we've had whatever board members it works for come down to the Capitol and meet with the THP RD delegation to go through um, our policy priorities, things we're interested in, and give kind of an update on the district. This year, they've asked organizations not to do those kinds of big events that draw people to the building um, but since we're small we probably we could do something however it may ha be have to be virtual we'll just have to see how things go and what the timing of when session is um, but that was really good and as I after the last mini lobby day we handed out maps and everything to everybody as we went along and I go back to the rest of the session and they've had those maps up on their walls and it was a good point to be able to come back to folks and, and touch base um, Lista um, I was just going to add that yeah since everything's going to be virtual i don't know if a lobby day makes sense but i think what would be great if we were super intentional about the newly elected officials um kate lieber wins bay campos um building relationships with them and making sure that they're familiar with our work i mean anecdotally i can say yes but um there's always more work to do and help them understand some of our values and priorities i think would be i, I think would be a good place for us to focus this year in in a COVID year. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, Tia. Oh, I was just going to say the same thing. Ky and Kylie, you just tell us what you need to do. We are all very good with, as Felicita says, taking on homework. And so our employees, you guys all do such great work and we're just kind of here to support. And if you tell us you need something, I'm sure all, all of us, um, even the ones who are not at the meeting today, are ready to help up and step up and do whatever you guys need. That's marvelous and much appreciated. And um, please, I take your point very well about the um, the new legislators. I, I couldn't agree more. And I think that what might make sense is to, because it is virtual and, and doing something person like what makes sense, it might be worth our time somewhere early in the session to just have one day where the board members can set aside and we can do some virtual meetings with legislators um, focusing on those new ones, but also still be able to do kind of the same thing and, and have it just be a day where it's on your guys' calendars to be able to do. So we'll play that a little bit by ear about how it, how it rolls out. Perfect. So we have one more minute. Does anybody have questions or Kylie, do you have any last minute things you need to get the out? Only last Thing I would say is because it is so weird and it's so unusual that the opportunities for gathering information, at least on my end or in my experience over the last week, are not nearly as robust as they are in, in when you can be in person. And since the information is so important as we move forward, if there's if you ever hear anything or um, come across something that you think might be helpful or um, that, that maybe I already know but you're not sure, please pass along anything that you think would be relevant or helpful um, because it's really key right now. And I know that can't be in all the same places that um, when you're in person, you can be. So that would be my last thing. Perfect. Thank you so much, Kelly, for your presentation and for your amazing work and for um, advocating for us and always keeping us up to date. All right. So I think- Thank we'll you so much. And are any questions? Good? Okay. Okay, sounds good. I think we'll close up this meeting and meet everybody else in executive <laughs> session. Thank you. Thank you very much.